Greetings and salutations. So last time on PCHEM, we went ahead and examined the shape and the energy of bonding orbitals that were constructed by putting a single electron in the symmetric combination of two hydrogen 1s orbitals. So this ended up producing an orbital that was lower in energy than our original hydrogen 1s orbitals, and this ended up forming our classic bond. But it turns out if something goes down, something else has to go up. And in that sense, we bring you our antibonding orbitals. So our antibonding orbitals are our asymmetric combination of a 1s hydrogen orbital centered around atom A, and then we subtract out the wave function for the 1s hydrogen orbital centered around B. And what this ends up producing is a wave function where we end up annihilating some of the uh, wave function character in the middle. As when we subtract the two, we end up with this region of destructive interference with a wave function passing through a zero value in the middle. And this is going to, as a product, shift some of our extra uh, density over to the uh, exterior sides as modified by our new normalization constant. So like last time, we went ahead and examined uh, our bonding orbitals through the probability density. And we can do that again here, where we're going to simply take the square of our wave function, which lets us pull out our normalization constant, and then we have our three major regions, the density around A, the density around B, and then this time, instead of adding a constructive region, we're subtracting out this overlap integral. So this is our same S that we used last time, which is going to provide a lot of benefits to us because this means that our wave functional form is fairly similar. One plus one minus two S instead of plus two S. So this is going to be a very similar uh, density uh, as we had for our or at least a very similar density form as we had for our bonding orbitals. But instead of building up extra density here and stealing it from the outside, we're doing the reverse. We're stealing some probability density from here and then moving it to the outside of our wave function. But because the functional form is fairly similar, this means that the energy equations that we used for the, uh, for the bonding orbital should be fairly similar to those we saw for uh, should be fairly similar to the ones we're going to use for the anti-bonding orbital. However, it is also useful to uh, look at what the uh, probability density looks like in a more visual perspective. So again, we have a node cutting through the middle where there will be no probability density. And then otherwise, it looks rather like we have two mountain peaks pushing away from each other with an exponential decay of slopes streaming down from these center points with again an extreme decay factor going down towards the middle point of the bond where no electrons will be found whatsoever. So keeping in mind this functional form of both the wave function and the density, let's go ahead and uh, revisit our energy equations. So as I said before, we'd expect our energy equation for our anti-bonding orbital to look somewhat similar to our bonding orbital. So not too surprisingly, our antibonding orbital energy will be still centered around that hydrogen 1s energy because there is a certain extent at which this electron likes to be hanging around our nuclei. And again, we haven't changed the presence of a nuclear uh, repulsion term, so this will also stay the same. So in this case, we have our same basic building blocks for our energy. But now we have to modify in the, uh, the terms that represent how the electrons interact with the nuclei. So when doing that, we are going to be, with the opposite nuclei, we're going to be bringing in a very similar term to what we saw previously. But previously we had J, which was the attraction uh, to the uh, energy, uh, to the electrons on the opposite atom. Well, this won't really change. I'm still going to be just as attracted to the electrons on the opposite uh, nuclei. 
But here we run into a problem because previously my overlap uh, density was entirely centered on uh, around the bond in between the two uh, nuclei, which brought our molecule together. This time it's going to be shifted away to the outsides of the nuclei. And so it's going to be this K term that really changes, not its value, but really its meaning. Because for our bonding orbital, this was an attractive term. As again, K is the uh, attraction energy in between the nuclei and the excess electron density. For a bonding orbital, it's centered in the middle, and we have this attractive term that brings my two nuclei together. But now that I'm dealing with an anti-bonding orbital, all of this extra density, there's still the same amount, but now it's sitting on the outside. And this is going to drive an effective repulsion between the two nuclei. Not so much because they don't like each other, we already factored that in, but now everything that they like is in the opposite direction of the other nuclei. So this builds in an effective repulsion. And when we pair our K with our already existing repulsive term, this can be quite devastating for the stability of a molecule. And again, one of the things that's gonna be noted is that this energy component is going to depend upon the distance between the two atoms. So instead of factoring this in with the usual R, we factor it in with a much more pr pragmatic uh, overlap integral. So again, if I've got two very close atoms, it means that their probability densities are going to have a large extent of overlap, a value near one. And as my overlap approaches one, this whole term approaches zero, and it turns out that this energy term kind of gets a little bit away from us. And this will end up driving a very large electronic repulsion. So let's look at this a little bit more visually in terms of what our energies look like. So we can go ahead and map out our two energy equations, both for the bonding orbital and for the anti-bonding orbital. And as we saw previously, if I go ahead and place an electron in my bonding orbital, I'm going to want to go downhill in energy towards I till I have a minimum value. And that's gonna be somewhere around this 2.5 region. Because what's happening is I've got a repulsive term from the nuclear repulsions, which dominates at very short distances. And then at longer distances, I have this attraction to the electrons on the opposite atom or in the bond. And that ends up uh, dying off as my um, S value decreases, as well as my J's and K's. And so it eventually dies out. But there's some critical point at which, uh, there's a critical point at which my attraction to the electrons will overwhelm my nuclei, and then some point at which it becomes maximally effective. And that's what we're really looking at with bonding orbitals. And so if I put a single electron in, my two nuclei are going to try and find this lowest energy state. Now, something unfortunate happens if I try and place an electron in the antibonding orbital. Because in the antibonding orbital, what I have is a repulsive term from the nuclear repulsion. And to that, I added in an extra effect of repulsion due to this excess electron density, which is going to, again, drive my two uh, atoms apart. And so doing this, if I place a single electron in my antibonding orbital, repulsive forces always dominate, and it turns out that I am going to want to have as large of a separation as possible. Thus, we often use the phrase that antibonding orbitals will cause a, a molecule to break apart the more you populate them. So the more electrons I put in an antibonding orbital, the less likely my two nuclei are to stick, uh, stick together. Now, it is worth noting that all of this uh, formulism so far is assuming the existence of a single electron, where we don't have to bring in any electron electronic repulsion. So we're going to start bringing that in a little bit in the near future, specifically starting next lecture. But before that, I want to 
bring in a new notation that we can use to talk about our bonding and antibonding orbitals that's fairly popular and our book really likes to use. And that's more or less using symmetry to distinguish in between our bonding and our antibonding orbitals. So we're going to make use of specifically something called inversion symmetry. So the idea of inversion symmetry is I have a center of my molecule, which I'm going to call my center of inversion. I can then go ahead and project my wave function from one point to an identical point on the opposite side of the center of the molecule. So these two distances will be the same. So it's just uh, going, making a line from the uh, point I'm at to the center of the molecule and then going to the equal point on the opposite end. Now, it turns out there is a useful kind of symmetry where the point I started at and the point I ended at have an identical uh, amplitude of the wave function and an identical sign. If this happens, it's called gerade symmetry. So this is German for even symmetry because it's even on either side. So we're going to give this a symbol of G. And specifically, let's say I'm looking at this sigma bond. Then I'm going to say, hey, it turns out I have a sigma bond or sigma orbital with gerade symmetry. So it becomes sigma G. So anytime you see a sigma G, we're really talking about a bonding sigma orbital. And this will let us talk about uh, sigma orbitals made not just out of 1s orbitals, but also 2s and 2p and 3s and 3p and so forth, which is a useful uh, feature as we go forward. But it turns out we also need to address our antibonding orbitals. So the antibonding orbitals have a very interesting property, which is that if I project uh, my wave function through the center of my molecule, I will have the exact same amplitude of my wave function, but it now has the opposite sign. So I still have symmetry of a sort, but it's uneven. And this is called Ungerod, which is German for odd symmetry. So the idea of flipping the sign as we do an inversion brings up this idea of odd. And similarly, as I called the sigma bond with Girard symmetry, sigma G, this becomes referred to as sigma U. And turns out that this is going to be often used when we're representing an antibonding sigma orbital. So get familiar, if I'm saying sigma U, I'm specifically talking about an antibonding sigma orbital. Now, it is worth noting that this technique is going to start breaking down a little bit as I have two different atoms, which will break down the evenness of both the, of the magnitude for both Girard and Ungerod symmetry. So as I go to heteronuclear compounds, and especially as I go to polyatomic compounds, uh, the exact technical uh, robustness of this technique does break down, but it doesn't mean that it isn't still used as people just got in the habit of saying, hey, sigma G, that's bonding. So this is something to be aware of as we move forward. So next time, we're going to be taking what we now know about bonding and antibonding orbitals as we go forward and finally put two electrons on a molecule. Till, uh, till then, take care and stay healthy.